Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. This is actually the production shop. I'm going to give you a 2022 Rob Cosman production shop tour. Stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe. Turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. If you look down on the floor, if you've ever been in a bowling alley, this was a bowling alley, a six-lane bowling alley that was owned by my father. And in the spring of 2017, uh, that closed, and we moved in, and we started tearing the place apart. And there was 50 years of dust it was a long process. I didn't realize it, but it took us almost a year to get it converted over. When we did do that, which would have been 2018, there were only five of us working. A couple, three, three of us full-time and two part-time. And uh, we didn't anticipate a lot of growth, and not fast as it happened. So what happened is we built the shop. In fact, when we first designed this, we were only going to go down about two-thirds of this room and then put some kind of a curtain so that we wouldn't be heating a part of the shop that we didn't need, and we had lots of space. Well, over a very short period of time, we grew to almost 25 employees, so we had to change things around, and we had to change them on the fly while we were extremely busy. So we finally have it pretty much settled. What we had to do was expand a one-man shop into a shop that would accommodate 10 to 12 people working at any given time, and that's a big change. So what I want to walk you or do is walk you through each area, tell you a little bit about the machinery that we have because I have a fondness for old stuff and fixing it up. And uh, as a bonus towards the end, I'll take you in the other side of the business where we actually do the shipping and the retail and my office and the rest of that. So we'll start on this side. If any of this backdrop looks familiar, this is where we did all of our filming for probably three years until I moved into a different shop. But now we have a fellow named Harold that works in here. And he's a retired cabinet maker, which is great because uh, I just tell him what I want and I don't have to tell him how to do it. So he spends most of his time in here building shooting boards. And if you're wondering what this is, this is called Osage Orange. It's a really hard wood and it's great for the fence on shooting boards. And that's what this pile is. So he's got his bench. He's got a shaper over here and we have no use for shapers anymore. So we actually use that as a, a place to clamp against when we build the shooting boards. And, what, and we put in some lumber racks. So he uses mostly maple and a, a little bit of pine and, of course, the Osage Orange. So that's the only wood you're going to find in this corner. And if you're curious about this, this is my very first workbench that I built back in 1988. And uh, nobody uses it anymore. Ken was using it for a while. So I'm going to convert it into something that I'll show you afterwards when we're done. And by that, I mean perhaps in a month's time. But I think you'll be interested to see what that's ultimately going to become. Uh, right behind me is uh, our chop saw. Uh, I really like Bosch. In fact, I think in our shop now we've got three of them. I think it's a great brand. And this is where we do all of the uh, rough cutting to length. We don't use it really for miters at all. Just instead of an old radial arm saw, which is what most folks would have used, I find the chop saw a lot more convenient. This is, a, this is an old Delta bandsaw. It's a 20 inch. We're just waiting on some blades to come in. But I really like this machine, and you can tell how good they are, I think, if you look underneath and you see what the apparatus is for blade guides. Everything is completely adjustable, and you can lock it all in place. Uh, a lot of cheap bandsaws today, you don't see very much of anything. It's loosen a screw, tap it, and away you go. But this, everything, is, is move, everything moves by some kind of a dial that allows you to get it in there. Exactly, uh, precisely. So great old machine, bought it on auction, restored it, and it works like a charm. This is my big general 20-inch thickness planer. It weighs a little better than a ton. And uh, interesting thing about this, we don't use it a whole lot, but uh, when you need it, you need it. If you look back here, we, uh, we upped it from a 5-horsepower to a 7.5-horsepower. And we only have single-phase power available to us in this shop. And because of that, uh, your motors get more expensive when you get into the higher horsepower. But I was disappointed that even though, even though it's a 7.5 horsepower, it really doesn't cut 
with the kind of capacity that I would have expected. This, is a, this general would have been uh, late 1980s. That company's no longer in business. But with the exception of belts, bearings, and motors, everything, all, all three of which you can easily replace if you have to. Uh, just, I love buying the old machinery. It's heavy, it's built to last, and what else can you say? We have a hardware store just beside us that changed hands several years ago. And uh, they changed the way they sell nuts and bolts. And I was able to grab two of these racks, which really is fantastic because we have everything from nuts and bolts and washers to various screws. And it's just a great place to be able to come and find exactly what you need when we keep it organized, which we try. Now in this corner, this is where most of the sanders are. This is an old General 100. This is a 16 inch disc and a, a six by 60 belt. Um, great rugged machine. Uh, I love that big 16 inch disc. It's, it's, uh, it really comes in handy when you're, we use it a, a ton actually. It's set up right now for doing the back end of the mallets. But this is some of the, one of the nice features that you see on it. When you adjust the tilt of your table, not only can you move it in and out, but you loosen it and then there's a crank and a rack and pinion so that you can very precisely get it exactly where you want before you lock, lock it back in. Good dust collection. I'll mention the dust collection separately a little bit later. And over here we have a, a, a six by 140, I think. Can't quite remember. This is a, a, an edge sander. It doesn't oscillate, meaning it doesn't go up and down, but it's a great machine. It's made by Progress, which is a company in Ontario. And just, I never thought I would use something as often as we end up using this. And you definitely have to have good dust collection on this. And if you can see the assortment of belts. There's probably more money tied up in belts than there is in the price of the machine. But yeah, everything right up to 400 grit and all the way down to 80 grit. Hey, if you like shop tour videos, I've got five more for you to check out. Friends of mine, including James at Woodby Wright. Also, Jeff and Danny and Bob and Kevin, who are combat wounded vets that I've been working with. Check out their shops. We'll leave links below. Drill Press. Hey, uh, one of the vets that... Uh, it came to our class, his name is Jake, and uh, I was complaining that the chuck on my drill press wasn't big enough. So the next thing I know, he sent me this one. I think he took it off of an aircraft carrier, something where the thing is huge. These are cabinets that we actually built on our, oh, by the way, that's a, uh, that's a jet, if you can't read it, a jet drill press. We don't have very many that aren't general, but I've been fairly satisfied with that for what we use it for. We built these cabinets in one of our online workshops and uh, this door got finished, but I had to steal the hinges for another project one day. And of course it sits down there. This one never did get finished. And those drawers on the end are still waiting to be done. Trying to keep a flat surface clean in a shop with 12 guys working is almost impossible. We could put somebody at a task on that every day of the week and it would still end up looking like that at some point. Um, we've had enough drill presses that we're actually able to designate two of them for just using our branding iron. And uh, a lot of the products that we make have our, our brand uh, burned into it. So it's nice to have two of these. Actually, we have a third one over there that are set up so that uh, it's just a matter of plugging it in, waiting for it to heat up, and away you go. Uh, we also keep belts. We have three different belt sanders, or three different sizes. We have the big ones that fit that one. We have the 60 inch, which fit the one I just showed you. But then we also have uh, four by, uh, six by 48, which fits another belt sander, a, a horizontal, a vertical belt sander that I'll show you down in that other end. Now over here, this is really the heart of the shop. And I would advise anybody, if you're gonna spend money putting together a shop, spend the majority of it on your table saw. A good table saw is a pleasure to use. A lousy table saw is not only dangerous, but it'll frustrate you. And I would gladly do commercials for saw stop. I think it's the best. Interestingly enough, we've got, their, uh, we've got a pretty good vintage in here. This is one of the originals. This would have been 2003 or four. That one on that side is about 2012. And I have one in my shop that was just last year. So there really hasn't been much change. They've upgraded a few things, but it's still just a great saw. And for all kinds of reasons, I actually did a video that I link you to on the table saw and you'll see what I mean. But after 20 years, it still works great. And we, we put them back to back just because with that many guys working, there's always somebody waiting for you to use a table saw. So we keep a rip blade on this one, mostly for ripping lumber. 
and we have a crosscut blade over there with the sled. And that one typically only gets used for cross-cutting and for smaller work. We keep all of our uh, table saw gadgets on this wall. And another drill press. This one, I find that uh, it's almost advantageous. I buy all this stuff at auction, so we don't, I don't, it doesn't cost very much. But it's almost, I think it's advantageous to have a drill press set up for one procedure so that you're not having to change it out all the time. This is the one that we use for drilling our mallet heads. So Sean Mahaffey, a friend of mine, sends us these. These are maple. They're uh, resin impregnated. So that increases the weight by about 30 or 40% and makes it very hard. We get them like that, and we've got to turn around and cut them into a hexagon and then drill a hole down the middle before we put the handle on them and turn them on the lathe. So that's pretty much it for what we do in this corner. I'll take you to the next one. I have a fellow that manages their shop. His name is Ken Anthony, and Ken's uh, extremely good at what he does. When I was doing this, and we were, this is where we build our saws, I was all over the place. I got more exercise just in building one saw from moving one machine to another in different spots. He localized it all and makes it far more efficient. So we start here. This is, this is not a general. This is a, a Wadkin that comes out of England. This is a dual 16-inch. That means you've got a disc on either side, so we keep a coarse one on one side and a finer one on the other. My only complaint is that the dust collection is not that great on these, so it tends to make a mess. That's why this shield is sitting here, just so that all that crap isn't thrown over there in the bandsaw. But we also have a little hood, a little uh, shop-built hood that we put on there with magnets just to help gather some of the dust when you're using it. Now, this is not my favorite brand. This is General International which is a, was a sister company to General. Uh, this stuff is made offshore. But it's, there's very few oscillating spindle sanders that you can find that are made locally or in North America. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with it. We haven't had any problems. We use it, uh, again, a lot more than I ever would have expected, when you, especially when we're doing handles and you've got to do on the interior curves. So there's various size spindles. We ever only use the one, but there's probably... Uh, eight or nine different diameters, right down to about three quarter. And then there's all the, this is again, this is where you spend your money, buying these sleeves, terribly expensive. And the dust collection to this actually is, is good, but we've had to modify it. We went in and we've enclosed this front part, so when you use it, it's really close. Or I mean, it, uh, it, it, the area around the spindle is very close and closed and does a really good job. So this alley is where Ian, and Rick work, and they're the ones that uh, are putting together the saws. So there's a stack of handles that are in some form of production. Here's blades in the brass waiting for handles. So this is the main work table. We have, I, I got a deal at an auction on a whole bunch of vices, and I uh, can't believe how much that improved things, just being able to hold things accurately. So assemblies over here, we use buffers. We've got two of them set up. And uh, the material that we use on our handle needs to be buffed in order to make it look nice and pretty. So that's what these are for. And again, good dust collection there, or else you've got that dirt and debris all over the place. So if you're uh, wondering where all the general drill presses went in the world, I have them. So one, two, three, four, five, that's not a general, but six, seven drill presses in this corner alone. And these are all for different processes. Again, it's so much more efficient when you don't have to strip it down and reset it up. So every one of these have an, uh, a job. This one counterbores the small hole in the handle. This one counterbores the large hole in the handle. What I like about these generals, they were built tough. There was no bells and whistles on them. In order to raise and lower the table, when, once you release that, or once you undo that clamp on the back, it falls to the ground. So. It was literally bare bones. There were no lights. So what they did do is they built into it precision so that you don't have that run out when you bring your quill down. You're not having to wiggle that. You're not wiggling that thing back and forth and dealing with uh, those kind of issues. And again, these are all set up for various procedures. Almost all of this has to do with manufacturing our saws. This one has a carbide bit in it. We have to drill through saw steel, so we've got to be able to use carbide that's how we attach the handles. 
We've got this. This is an old general bandsaw. This dates back probably in the early 60s. And this one, we have a metal blade in, and we use that for cutting various bits of brass and other things that we use in the production of saws. And we have another bandsaw here. This is another general. This, this kind of was the, uh, the mainstay of the general brand. This was their 15-inch bandsaw. There's a lot of shops in Canada anyway and along the Canadian-U.S. border that would have this bandsaw. It was a great saw. It was expensive, but it was extremely well built. And we have a blade in there that's designed just for cutting plastic. So a lot of our packaging we go out, it goes out in plastic tubes. So we found the most efficient way to uh, cut them was using this. And over here on this side, we keep all of our all of the blades for the different saws. Of course, I can't find them. They're down here. These are the these are our, the, our blades. And then down here is the brass that we've processed but haven't used it yet. So it's been engraved, the slot's been cut in it, and it's been cut down from the one inch by six foot that we buy. Another, another uh, nice workspace where a lot of stuff happens in the name of saws. So this is pretty much the center of the shop. This is where most of the guys have their workbench. So Ken works at this one, Rick, or, Rick works at that one, Tony. Tony's a combat wounded vet that works with us a couple of days a week. We also have Al, and Al is a combat wounded vet as well, and he works two days a week, so they kind of share a space. This is our eight inch joiner that gets a lot of use. We're actually just getting ready to send this to Bob Abbott, and Bob is uh, one of the combat wounded vets that came to our class, and Bob's in the process of starting a, a woodworking business. In fact, if you watch any of our Saturday Night Live YouTube workshops, we often get, we give away now stuff that we've bought from various vets that are running woodworking business. And Bob does a really popular um, cutting board. If you go on our site, robcosman.com, you'll see an area in there that will lead you to a lot of these uh, individuals' websites. So this is going to Bob. This is, uh, this is back when Rockwell and Delta made really good equipment. This has got that segmented head made by Bird, which is absolutely the best thing that ever happened to a jointer. The reason we're selling it is I had an opportunity to buy a Poitra 8-inch joint, uh, jointer, which was a company out of Quebec that was bought by General, and they absorbed it. I think uh, that happened probably 25, 30 years ago, maybe even longer, but really good machine. Couldn't pass it up. So over here, we have another General. This is a 16-inch jointer, and this one doesn't, this, we often doubles as an aircraft carrier. It doesn't get used very often, but if you need the capacity of a 16-inch joiner, we've got it. It was an auction find, and it was in great shape, so why not? Can't tell you much more about that because it doesn't get used a whole lot. This is a special machine, a, a press. So when we put together our, uh, our dovetail saws, we hold the blade in the brass. It sits in a slot. We use an, an adhesive, but then to make sure that it doesn't come out, we drill it and put, insert four copper pins and the brass holes are peened on either side, or pardon me, flared on either side, and then we peen the brass pins in place, which means they are kind of squeezed in both sides. I used to do that with a hammer on, a, on an anvil and sit there and tap, 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 and when you're teaching somebody new, a lot of moose tracks on the brass. Well, Willie, who is an 80-year-old retired fabricator that makes all kinds of stuff for us, built us this press, so now the guys can sit that brass in there and one step on the uh, pedal, and those pins are done perfectly. Now, I've got two general lays. These are the, uh, I think this was the 260. I don't know the name. Yes, it's the 260s. And this was the best general, best lay that general made. These ones also have the, uh, the height adjustments or height pieces added. So there's a block on, on the headstock, on the tailstock, and that gives you a lot more swing or, or distance between the center of the spindle and the top of the bed. So my son Rex works here, and Rex makes the marking gauges, so you can see various marking gauges in the process being turned. He also turns the lays as well as Harold. And uh, we ended up having guys, we, we do a lot on the lathe, so we had to get two, and uh, they both get used quite heavily. Those workbenches in the side were just shop built, but you all, always need more space. And it uh, seems to me the more cupboards we built, the more shelves we built, the more stuff we have to put on them. So one last section, we'll cover back here. 
And then I'll take you and I'll show you the dust collecting system. And then as a bonus, we'll go out and I'll show you the shipping room and what we do out there. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our newsletter has subscriber only content, monthly discount on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. We end up doing a lot more metal work than I ever would have thought. So we dedicate this back half to mostly processing uh, the metal aspects of the tools we make. I, I introduced you to the bandsaw, the old general, and that actually has a gearbox in the back so that you could slow it down to turn very slow for cutting metal or speed it up and use it as a regular wood cutting bandsaw. Pretty interesting old piece of equipment. Here's a drill press that I got that uh, the spindle was bent, so rather than try to fix it, we just ended up using this as another one of those places where we could put a branding iron. And uh, my two boys, Rex, uh, um, Bo and Mitch, a lot of what they do is the packaging. So they burn the label into all of those boxes that you see when you get a saw. This is where we sand the uh, blades of the saws flush. With the, they're flush. We sand the copper pins flush with the blades of the saw, the backs of the saw. This is, the, uh, this is an old Delta uh, 6 by 48 vertical belt sander and uh, I got it for next to nothing. It's not very heavy duty but it works great. We've used it for a long time and really happy with it. Again, harkens back to a time when they actually did things right. This is another, this is the exact same belt sander that we have up in that end but we uh, have a different use for it. So again, a lot of metal is processed on this. And it's got great dust collection as well. So it does a really good job. All kinds of tools are necessary. Here's a, a, our metal working bench where we have a nice big, these big record vices on either end and they get uh, just great to have those. Now over here, this is, a, this is something Willie made us. When we, we get a shipment of plywood, we use a lot of plywood and MDF and it's heavy as lead. So Willie made this rack for us. So you can stack plywood on either side and then move it from the front door where it arrives back here to our racks where we keep all of our material and we try to keep it nicely organized so that you know at a look what we're out of and what we need to get ordered. This is an old Poitra 24 inch bandsaw and uh, don't have any use for it anymore. I've got more bandsaws than I have kids. So this is going to Kevin Burris. Kevin is another combat wounded vet, that uh, a good friend of mine. He's in upstate New York, and Kevin started a business recently. And Kevin does a lot of um, Kevin does a lot with uh, laser engraving and uh, cutting boards and shoot, 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 how do you pronounce that? Charcuterie boards. Charcuterie so he was saying the other day he needed a, one thing he needed was a bandsaw with a lot of capacity. So I'm happy to have it find a home. Cost a fortune to ship it to them, but uh, it'll be worth it when, it when it arrives. Good big saw. Again, they were, they were, this band company was bought out by General, and they actually incorporated some of their designs into the General line, and others they just um, ended. Now over here, this is our grinding station. So we do a lot of grinding. We make 17-degree uh, chisels. We make half-blind dovetail chisels. And uh, we make we grind the sides of the blade that go into our drawer bottom plane. So it's quite a bit of work. So you see all the grinders and Ken put together this space. Uh, all the dust collection here just goes into a vacuum. You don't want to be pulling sparks into your big dust collector. And this blanket on the floor is for um, our shop dog, whose name is Maggie. And she's actually very good natured. She comes in, she knows who has treats. And there's where she spends most of her day. Back here is a lot of where we just store our materials, um, metal stuff, all, all this stuff over here. Actually, these are bits and pieces for our wood hinge drill jigs. There's some overflow of the uh, saw blades. We have a fireproof cabinet back here where we store all of our flammables. And I'm getting a whole lot better at uh, paying attention to things like that. I'll talk to you about our dust collection and our air filtration as well. This is where the excess handles go for the saws. Now in here, Tony's in the process of putting up a whiteboard. But in here is the dust collector. I'll turn the light on so you can see it. This is fairly new. This is another Oneida dust collector. This is the one that operates in my shop. 
but I didn't have room for it over there. So we built this separate little spot over here just to uh, give me a little more sp um, walking space in that shop. And this is also where we have our big dust, or, pardon me, our compressor. And that's just to keep some of the noise out. It's annoying to have to listen to something like that running all the time, but we've got it boxed in such that you can hardly even hear it. Now over here, we are in the process, so we're going to start making and selling uh, woodworking benches based on that design of the, the Cosman workbench. So we are... We've just been overloaded, so we haven't had time to devote to it. But there's another drill press that will be set up for drilling the holes, for the dog holes on the bench tops. This is a, uh, a jig that uh, Willie made us for gluing up the tops so that we can get them nice and flat. And sure beats trying to put on 500 clamps. This is a uh, saw sharpener, an old Foley bell saw saw sharpener that at some point I actually plan to get up and running so just to play with it. So that's, and the last part over here is our, is our spray booth. And uh, we spray our shooting boards, we spray our mallets. Uh, we do a lot of shooting boards, so a fair, bit of, a fair bit of finish gets applied in there. Now, the next thing I want to do is I just want to talk, walk you through the, uh, the dust collection and the air filtration, because it's a huge part. Uh, if you're going to work in a shop, you want it to be as safe as possible, and it's comfortable. I've never been one to be overly concerned about that stuff, but I realize how important it is now, so I pay a lot more attention than I did. So I'll take you out back and show you where our dust collector is. So this used to be where we did a lot of the saw production. And as I said earlier, Ken came in and organized it to make it much more efficient. Uh, I actually have a couple of drill presses that aren't being used right now, but and we even have a backup compressor. Remember, we expanded so fast that... Uh, we weren't set up to have that many people working, so we, we had to make some changes. This compressor will kick in if that one gets overloaded. This is our dust collector. This is a large Oneida. We elevated it so that the shot coming into the tank would go straight across and not have to go out under the floor and up. We're about a foot lower out here than we are in the main shop. We've got a vent to the outside, so uh, whether it's too hot or just to want to bring in some fresh air, that'll run on a timer and keeps it cir circulated. This is, a, this is a five horsepower unit. It's the largest single phase that they make. We had the drum uh, added to, so it would have a greater capacity. And uh, overall, pretty happy with it. Um, I can't, uh, really don't have any complaints. We added an extra section, if you want to come over here. We added two things here. We added um, this extra section to the bottom, which increased the size of the filter. And we added this black section, which was a noise dampener. And I was shocked at how much noise or how the volume, uh, the, pardon me, the amount of noise dropped when we added that on. It was quite remarkable. We have an air filtration unit up overhead for out here, even though this area doesn't get used much anymore. We do do a little bit of work. We, we cut our brass to length. We store all of our, our uh, brass for our saws back here. And we have a chop saw set up at the very back, and that chop saw is designed with a blade in it specifically for cutting brass, so that type of work gets done out here. Now, if you go overhead, remember we built this with a one-man shop in mind, and then we had to expand it. So uh, my son Jake did all of the, uh, the duct work, but we had to expand and take off and go over in this section as well. We, we ran lines along that outside back wall to give us some dust collection at the drill presses, and then up overhead, we came out with a nine inch main. The first thing we did is drop down here and that provides us with dust collection to the chop saw and also to the spindle sander. And then right here we drop down and we pick up dust collection for both the bandsaw and the uh, dual disc. One of the heaviest draws is on the a requirement is on the uh, thickness planer. So that goes from a nine to a six. And then we pick up our table saws, and you want really good dust collection here. And I should mention, I bought this overarm at an auction and uh, really impressed. We process a lot of MDF, and that's the worst stuff to breathe. When we have this in place, you can't even smell it. It does such an incredible job of gathering it right at the point, and just it's fantastic. Of course, we have the, the jointer has to be hooked up, and then we, we really branch out all over the place. Not terribly efficient to be coming to the wall over and then coming back, but 
there's not a great amount of need over there. It's the fine dust coming off of the uh, disc sander and at the drill press. And then of course we've got another heavy, a big line dropping down to service this big jointer. Um, never thought I would want du as dust collection at the lathes, but that's such a help. When you're sanding over there and it can be such a mess, we have that set up so that it's just great. It pulls it right at the source and uh, does a wonderful job. Now, you also notice up above that we have four air filters that run all the time we're in the shop. They're made by Powermatic, and we have them in such a way that they circulate the air around, and it does a really good job of keeping the air as clean as possible. But everybody has, we provide really good dust masks, so everyone is encouraged to use it whenever you're working around anything that's producing a dust. This is just catching the, uh, the extra stuff. So that's what happens in here. We produce uh, more and more all the time. Our sales have been going through the roof for the last two years, ever since COVID hit. And uh, we have a really great bunch of guys that work in here. They do very good work and just a pleasure to, pleasure to be around them. I'm gonna take you outside in the, uh, out to the back room and show you our operation where we do all of our shipping and storing and needs to be organized, but we're working on it. When we first moved in here in 2018, we thought we would have a little showroom at the front of the building, but we don't do a whole lot of local business. And as things exploded on us overnight, this ended up becoming a break room for the guys that work here and over an overflow room for excess inventory for benches that the bench brigade are constantly bringing us. These go to the vets that come to our classes over here in this corner. There's a part of the stockpile of our Schoberg vices. When you're dealing with the uh, COVID issues today, particularly on supply chain, if it's available, you've got to take it. And you literally, we try to grab as much as we can, not knowing what's going to happen in the near future. So we'll come through here. Oh, I want to show you this. Uh, Kevin Lasky is a, the artist that does a lot of work for us, but he's also a carpenter. And I tasked him with making our little kitchen look a little more presentable. And I thought he did a fantastic job based on what he had to work with. When we first opened for business here in 2018, our shipping room was from me to the wall. It was about eight feet by maybe 12, and that's our entire shipping. This was a coin-operated laundromat behind me, and in the time it took us to take out the laundromat to expand the shipping room, the shipping room expanded out here into our, what was our classroom to take up essentially all of it. And as a result, we had to move our classroom over to the next building where my shop is, which is okay because we made a far better classroom than what we had. But business has really blossomed. These are more vices, Schoberg vices. I'll show you just briefly what we have in here. We make about 40 to 50% of what we sell. So we have our shooting boards. We have our Wood River Plains. I was hired by Woodcraft back in 2008 to help them develop that hand plane line. So as a result, we have a, the opportunity to sell them. We have our PEC. Uh, these, these guys make what I think is some of the best um, measuring devices. This is a combination square. Great, great value, great precision, and a great price. They have, we have steel squares, steel rules. It's about everything you can think of when it comes to measuring your layout. These are the uh, items, some, a lot of the items that we make here. My son Rex makes the marking gauges. We have Kerfex 10s, our mallets, more planes, all the different cutters that fit your marking gauge, which turns it into a very versatile tool. DVDs from the past, chisels over here. Uh, this is the bulk of our business is making saws. We now have our sixth saw that we just designed and started producing. There's four or five of us on any given day that are working on saws. So that is uh, that is what we're known for. But of course, it's grown to a whole lot more. These are our Shapton stones. We have big inventory of Shapton. These are the best sharpening stones you can get. They come from Japan, more, uh, more um, supply chain issues. So we try to stock as much as we can get a hold of. More chisels, maple syrup, got to have maple syrup, uh, screws. Gina and Pam work in here. They're the two that fill the orders. So we try to get them out the same day. So if you're, uh, if you're waiting for something, it's on its way. Out here, show you a little bit more as all of our packing materials. 
my three youngest, Bo, Mitch, and Chloe, their workstations are over here, and they do a lot of the packaging. So that's what happens here on any given day. And then this, this office back here is reserved for our new employee, which will take over and deal with customer service and trying to keep all of this straight. So I, all I can say after uh, four years, two three years, is that uh, we're still catching our breath from how much how fast business grew. We love it. It's a ton of fun. It's a challenge. And if you're looking for really good tools, check us out. I want to show you our, our supply of Shapton. Uh, we got a big shipment in, and it just keeps coming, but it goes out as fast as we get it. So we've had to create space constantly. Anyway, I, I realize this shop is not what the average guy is going to have access to, but hopefully you'll pick up a few pointers from it. We'll do, in the near future, we'll do a shop tour of my small shop, which is much more uh, the home, home hobbyist type shop. Anyway, I hope this was enjoyable, and I hope you have a happy new year. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the plane and chisel icon below, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our in-person and online workshops.